Stephen Martinez interviews Jesus on the subject of religion and violence. The interview took place in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia on the 7th of September 2012. I'm Stephen Martinez, uh, from the University of Queensland. Yeah. I'm here uh, to interview, of course, yourself, AJ Miller, yeah. uh, for my religion, peace and violence class, yeah. specifically on the topic of religion and violence and does religion cause violence and how can religion help create peace building among interfaith? Mm -hmm. Very good questions. So uh, first, of course, to start out, I'd like to uh, ask you, can you give me a brief overview of your religious ideologies and philosophy? Well, <laughs> the best thing to do is to say that we don't have a religious ideology, but we do have a, have a lot of beliefs about love. So we feel that love should um, in, be involved in every single interaction with every single thing on the planet. So this includes politics, religion, economics, a medical profession, and every, any, other, any other form or, or of endeavour on the planet should be governed by love. If it's governed by love, then we can create a lot of beautiful things on the planet. If it's not governed by love, then, then we're going to create a lot of disasters on the planet, which is what we're currently doing. Secondly, there are two forms of love. There's the kind of love that comes from within the individual, that's expressed outward to any person or, or thing around about. And then there's the kind of love that comes from God that can enter the individual. And, uh, and we believe that this love that comes from God that enters the individual can transform the individual and therefore help them become more loving in their expression of their love that comes out of them towards the rest of the world and, and, and the rest of, things, of the environment, the things in the world. And we feel that there's only a few things that need to be done to make sure that this love enters the person. One is the, to be in a state of humility, and the second one is to be open to truth, but not just to our personal truth, but also to universal truth, to divine truth. And we feel that process is a very scientific sort of a process, a, a process that's governed by you know, what's happening in the world around us and then putting into place some ideas that we can then test to see are true or not. So that's the underlying philosophy in a very, in a very small nutshell. Of course, obviously, of course. obviously, you know, there's a lot more involved in that. There's 700 hours of videos uh, that we've <laughs> produced already about those kind of subjects. So, so that you know, obviously, there's a lot involved in those particular things. But that's the underlying principles. Yeah. Um, now, to just elaborate on that, and just to to see, um, just kind of like probe into it, can love ever cause violence? No, not love in itself, mm -hmm. and in this regard we have to look at whose definition of love. Of but uh, love in itself, and, and here I'm talking about God's definition of love, can never actually cause violence, ever. And in fact, uh, the problem that we have on the planet is that we do not accept God's definition of love, but rather we have a tendency to accept our own definitions of what we believe love to be. And if we believe love to be things that, that God knows it, it is not, then of course the things that we believe can certainly cause violence. But once we bring our love into complete harmony with the way God loves, there would never be any violence actually on the planet. But, uh, but to do that we need to make some pretty severe changes and the changes have to occur inside of the hearts of people rather than just as a collective group. Um, now, of course, from a realist perspective, one would say that you can never have a hundred percent of the population with you know with one one perspective. So, if you do have one one kind of outlier who does do a violent act, how should the ones with both individual and God's love how should they react? Well. And we were just discussing this actually before you came. Um, the, the, how should we react to people's free will is a, is a question that needs to be asked. Well, firstly, if you look at what is happening on the planet at the moment, collectively we have a certain definition about love, what we believe love to be. For example, collectively there is a definition, particularly in the Western world, that it, that it is loving to go to war under certain circumstances. Well, I would argue that it's never loving to go to war. 
But while the collective group of individuals believe that it is loving to go to war, then of course they're going to elect a person that is willing to go to war, and then of course both the people and the, the elect, elected representative will go to war under certain circumstances. If it was not loving to ever go to war, and the elected representatives, or sorry, the, the people in the electorate believed that it was not loving to go to war, then they would never elect a representative that would cause them to go to war. And so firstly we need to see the relationship between what's in the hearts of individual and then what is collectively done. So if collectively we all agree to something that's out of harmony with love, then there is always going to be some kind of negative response to what we collectively agree. But if we collectively agreed what love really was, and we collectively, for example, in the previous example ago, we collectively agreed that war was not a loving act, then, then anybody who desired to go to war would have to be corrected in some way. Now, we would want to correct them in a loving manner, <laughs> not in an unloving manner. So the normal way to correct people in this world that we live in is to correct them by force. And, and that is not a way to correct any individual. And in fact, usually what that does is it creates more unloving behaviour and therefore a higher rebellious response in the person who's being corrected. And then in the end we get this snowball effect of a person who believes themselves to be loving attacking a person who they believe isn't loving and then the person feeling resentment about being attacked and then they, their resentment builds into anger and rage and eventually into violence and then they attack the person who believes themselves to be loving even more and then there's this cycle of violence that continues. And for a cycle of violence to stop, certain things have to change. And one of the things that have to change is that we all need to learn how to forgive. We all need to change in the way that we interact with each other with regard to when we're hurt. So back to the question of how do we then react with a person who is out of harmony with the collective uh, viewpoints. Well the way we act is we place the person in a state of let's call it isolation where they develop either the will or not to change. Now once they develop the will to change then we engage them in the process of changing in a practical environment, in a practical way. We don't force the change upon them, but, and we don't punish them for thinking the way they think, but we also, if they are damaging to the rest of the environment, so this is where we would only restrict them if they have been damaging to the rest of the environment, if they have been damaging to other people, if they have been violent towards other people, that is the only reason why we would ever restrict them, and if we restrict them, we then wait for them to want to change. And when, when they want to change, then we help them go through this process of change. And that's going to re require counselling, psychological assistance, help about their childhood and what belief they, systems they have that are out of harmony with love. It's going to require a team of people just to help one individual to, to change in that way. But it is possible to achieve. There's plenty of people on the planet who would love to be involved in that process. So it's certainly possible to achieve. But, but it's going to have to start from the right definition. And so the right definition is, if I am doing something to you that I personally would not like you to do to me, and in particular if I am being violent towards yourself, and thereby restricting your will, then it would make sense from a society collective perspective that my will is restricted. Then, through the restriction of my will, we create a loving environment for the person to go through a process of change and recovery from that unloving perspective that they're holding. We look at the reasons why they have this unloving perspective that they have, that they feel that it can be violent towards another or harm another in any way. And this is something that we need to do as a society. We need to define what love would do. And I feel it's quite obvious in our current society that love would never be violent. And, and therefore, um, and even though I say it's quite obvious, quite often we allow it, even in parents with children, and we allow it you know, in society quite frequently. But it is quite obvious, we have many laws associated with the fact that trying to prevent violence, so it's quite obvious that, that violence is not loving. So what we need to do collectively then is restrict the will of the people who are being violent. 
And then once we restrict their will, we do it in a loving manner. We're not doing it out of our own personal rage about what they did. We're not doing it so that they, we punish them. So if they've murdered somebody, we're not doing it because we want revenge. We're not doing it because we want to attack them in any way. We're not doing it because we want to harm their children the way they harmed ours or any other form of revenge that may occur because all of that would be unloving as well. We do it because we love the individual and we want to assist them to change. Now, it could be in, under that circumstance that that individual remains incarcerated for the rest of their life. If they desire to never change, if they desire to remain violent, and if they desire to not accept any help, then that would be the case. But it's highly unlikely that such a person would desire that. Uh, highly unlikely given what kind of assistance we can give them, because we can give them very, very good assistance if we know what love is. Yeah. So I feel restricting a person's will is, is, is viable, certainly, as a condition of love when the person is choosing to be violent, when the person is choosing to attack other people and be violent in their nature, then of course as a society we must restrict the will. That also applies to countries. We can restrict the will of countries without going to war to, with them. In fact, there's far greater ways to restrict the will of a country than there is to go to war with the country. And, and most people now know that. But going to war is generally due to rage, and other emotions within the individuals that then are collectively gathered within the society and then the society has an elected representative who, who reflects those particular principles and then of course they're willing to go to war under those circumstances. But the reality is that every country on the planet, if it had a loving viewpoint of violence, then it would want to restrict the will of the country that decides to attempt to go to war without attacking it in return. And that might mean the loss of some lives, but, but in the end, um, it, it, if everyone is firm for the principles of love, rather than being firm for their own self, selfish welfare, <laughs> which is the way most people on the planet are, if we're all firm for the principles of love and the principles of truth, then we're all governed by higher ideals. And once we're all governed by higher ideals, we won't be governed by the selfish ideals of greediness or, or other ideals. Uh, which we are currently governed by, will be governed by these higher ideals. So, but to do that, something has to change in the heart of the individual. It has to start in one person's heart, and then it's got to go to, eventually, to all persons' hearts. Yeah. Very true. Mm. Now, um, the idea of inter international, like different nations, you know, having war, uh, puts you know, puts violence onto a different perspective, a different um, different level, of course. Mm -hmm. So, this is when I have to ask the question, do you think the secularization of governments, such as the separation of church and state, uh, helps reduce violence, or just help reduce religious violence, or neither? Well, it certainly helps reduce violence, but we've got to understand why. I think there's enough physical evidence to see that the states uh, who, who have separated church from state have less tendency to be violent both internally and externally. But we've got to examine the reasons why that's the case. And to do that, I feel you've got to go by, right back to the actual basis of belief systems in religion. If you, if you examine the belief systems in most religions, most begin with an unloving God. And when I say that, most begin with a God who has a tendency to wrath and who has a tendency towards punishment. In other words, whenever... Um, the ideals of this particular God, who I believe is an imaginary God, um, because I don't believe that God exists, this God that goes to war and is willing to punish and, and be wrathful, that God certainly doesn't exist in, in, in any of the universes I've seen. But, but the reality is most people on earth believe that kind of God exists. So we all accept that that kind of God exists. And why do we accept that? We need to examine the reason why we have these religious beliefs that have been created that cause us to believe that such a God exists. Because the reality is, if we look at it quite uh, honestly with ourselves, that kind of a God is worse than most of us are ourselves. Most of us do not have a desire to go to violence. Most of us uh, uh, would prefer to see a peaceful environment. And if we're at the same time saying that this is what we are like, 
and yet God has a tendency to go to war under certain circumstances, and God has a tendency towards violence under certain circumstances, and God is willing to murder millions, you know, I think, I think if people have counted up the Bible record of the actual numbers that have been murdered by God, and it's over quite a few million, but that doesn't include people like you know, at the so-called time of Noah's day, <laughs> where the whole earth was destroyed. And so, so the reality is the Bible itself and other holy books too portray an angry, wrathful, punishing God who agrees with the destruction of people who do not believe the same particular things that we believe. Now, this viewpoint of God is very much in error. It, it is way out of harmony with love, firstly. But secondly, it then justifies violence of all forms. So as long as I have a self-righteous viewpoint that my opinion is correct, my, my belief in an angry God then causes me to feel that certain anger within myself has a, violent, has a justification. So I become self-righteous. So in becoming self-righteous, what I finish up doing there is I can judge you um, as not being righteous and then also have a tendency to take out violent acts towards you in order to correct your unrighteousness. <laughs> and if you examine uh, the general process of what happens in most religions, this is what is the underlying thing. And so what we've got to do is we've got to start looking at this, what I believe is the fundamental question. And the fundamental question is, why do we believe in an angry God? That's the fundamental question. I think there are very clear answers to that question too. Um, but, and maybe we can go into some of those in a minute. But, but if you look at that fundamental question, while I believe in an angry God, I'm also going to believe in the justification of violence. And if I'm going to believe in the justification of violence, then I'm going to create circumstances where my, where my violence towards another person is justified. Now, in some cases, that can be, well, if they attack me, I justify myself attacking them in return. Right? That has historically been the justification. Nowadays, the justification is, if they're going to attack me, then I should attack them first. That's another justification of violence. But, but those, both of those justifications of violence come from this belief that God has justified violence in some way too. And I feel if you look at the relationship between religion and violence, you can see because mankind believes in a God that is, that is wrathful, angry and punishing, now mankind themselves can justify themselves acting in the same manner that God acts. And it won't be the way God acts, but it will be rather the way they define God as acting. And this is where I feel the majority of the religious difficulties come in terms of the religious perpetration of violence. If you look even inside of the religions, like we were just listening to a show today about the gay people and, and them being attacked by religion, and, and if, you look at, if you look at even that, there is a religious right, we call them, who have a certain uh, viewpoint about gay people that God is going to destroy the wicked and their definition of a wicked person is a gay person. Um, so now God will destroy a gay person. So that then justifies their attack of a gay person. Right? And now any atheist on the planet, generally, would look at that situation and go, what's wrong with these people? Like, it doesn't make any sense that violence perpetrated towards another is an act of love. And yet, because they have become self-righteous, they are willing to perpetrate violence even if it's a verbal attack, upon a group of people that they disagree with. That is out of harmony with love, but it's also out of harmony with peace on the planet. So sooner or later, that kind of treatment is going to cause all sorts of backlashes, all sorts of problems between people, because of the unloving behaviour that began by the religious justification of the act. And I believe there's many reasons why we religiously justify these acts. And they've got nothing to do with God. And they've got nothing to do with religion, actually, either. I feel they've got much, much more to do with our own emotional belief systems that we had even before we accepted a religion. So I suppose that brings us to the question of what, what caused us to accept this religious idea um, as 
that God is an unloving, violent, punishing, wrathful being. Uh, and in fact, that God's willing to kill far more people than we are personally willing to kill. Like, the average Christian believes there is a time coming, the future time of Armageddon, which, which uh, you know, the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation and other books, and, and they believe that uh, God will come uh, in the guise of Jesus, myself, uh, which is obviously something I disagree with completely, but they believe that God will come in the guise of Jesus with all of these angels and completely annihilate the wicked. Right? And the Bible does actually state that, of course. Now, now, none of us would ever agree to genocide on the planet, but we're basically saying by accepting that belief that we do agree with God, a God of genocide. <laughs> so it's no wonder, historically, there's been many genocides occurring on the planet when most of us, personally, who are of some kind of religion, believe in a God of genocide. And to me, this does not make any sense whatsoever if we, we want to have peace on the planet. Yeah. Of course. And also, it, it's not my, it's not how I see God. Like, God is definitely very, very different to the way in which everybody, including most religions, portray God to be. So, in the end, we've got to ask ourselves why we accepted this concept of God. And I believe the reason why is because our parents were generally violent towards us under some circumstances and they told us that it was loving for them to be violent under some circumstances and as a result of this we then accept violence as an act of love which which is crazy I know but it's what we accept emotionally and once we accept, accept violence as an act of love it is, it, is a, it is a very minor extension to then say that God, who loves us, is also willing to consider violence. Can you see the relationship? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so then that, that brings me to the question, obviously, is should the Bible be read literally or metaphorically? Because if it literally does state that, uh, like in Deuteronomy, that, um, that Adam or Abraham should kill all the Canaanites and everyone. Mm -hmm. Revelations, of course, that everyone's going to be killed, mm -hmm. uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. So should that be taken uh, metaphorically, or is the Old Testament and the violent acts of the New Testament sort of uh, more of a teaching tool than an actual... Well, I don't believe you can ever teach anybody the truth with violence, <laughs> or threats of violence. So I don't believe it was a teaching tool. I believe what happened with the Bible is, is this. There are some things in the Bible which are very loving in their concepts and, and many of the things that it's recorded that I said in the first century were, were loving. Not all of them, of course, because, because there were inaccuracies in terms of what people could accept or believe. But the reality is the majority of the Bible cannot be God's Word. And the reason why it cannot be God's Word is quite simple, because it portrays a, a God who is wrathful and punishing. Anything that says that God is wrathful and punishing cannot be the truth because that would make God worse than I am. And in my opinion, God has far more knowledge, power, wisdom and understanding than I do. So therefore, God would also be more loving than I am. And therefore, it was impossible for the, Bible, for, for the God of the Bible to actually exist. I do believe God exists, but, it, but not the God of the Bible, not the wrathful, angry God who's punishing. Now, the way I feel to look at the Bible is quite simple. It doesn't really matter whether it's literal or not. What matters is what is loving coming from it or not. So what I would do if I was reading the Bible, and I read the Bible quite frequently still, and I've, in the first century I read what you know most people would believe to be the Bible nowadays, you know, the Old Testament and the prophets, and this is what I did when I read it. I look at it and I ask myself the question, is this concept loving? Just a simple question. Is this concept loving? And is this concept loving or is this a concept of anger, a concept of wrath, a concept of rage, violence? Which one is it? Because if it's a loving concept, then I can accept it. If it's an unloving concept, then I must reject it. If I'm ever going to be a peaceful person myself, 
and a person living in harmony with love myself, then I must reject it. And I believe that if we looked at the Bible or any other holy book, you know, because this applies to, to the Koran and any other holy books on the planet, the same principle applies. If the principle being explained is loving, then let's retain the principle. If the principle being explained is unloving and wrathful, violent, then, then let's get rid of it because, because it doesn't belong. It doesn't belong in our concept of God and it doesn't belong in a peaceful, loving environment on the planet. It doesn't belong in international relations. It doesn't belong in our relationship with our friends. And it doesn't belong even in our relationships with our partner or with any other thing that we may live our life. If, if it's a concept that is wrathful, violent, uh, you know, and enraged and punishing, then it does not belong in our society at all. And to get to that point, I have to be willing to forgive what is wrong rather than try to punish what is wrong. Because if I try to punish what is wrong, I'm now also going through the same process myself. I'm now believing in a wrathful mm. self uh, as well as a wrathful God. And so I would need to correct that. So, so I believe the way to uh, deal with the issue is to firstly ask myself with anything that I read, is this concept loving? Would I want this to be done to me if I was in that situation? Remember that was the that was the guideline that I placed in the first century. The guideline I placed in the first century was this understanding that whatever I would like you to do to me is what I would do to you. Not whatever happens to me, I'll do to you. <laughs> but whatever I would like you to do. So so if what happens to me is you attack me, well, what I would like for you to do is to not attack me. And if I would like that, then surely that's what I should do to you, not attack you in return. And this is something that is a very basic Christian principle <laughs> that hardly any Christian religions follow. All right? and, uh, and in fact, uh, I believe, uh, in terms of uh, Christian principles, I feel Gandhi was very right you know, when he said that your Jesus was you know, in a, in a Christ-like state, in the sense of a, in, in a Christian state, and in a loving state, but the religion that follows him is not. Right? And the reality is there's many concepts in the Bible that are very basic like that. If you look at, for example, in, if you look at Matthew in the, in the books of you know, 5 to 7, 5 to 7 of the books of Matthew, you will see over and over concept of rage and what my, or, or if people can't accept on Jesus, what Jesus' opinion of rage was, right? What, what Jesus' opinion of loving your enemy was right? and what Jesus' opinion is of judging other people. They were all mentioned in those, three, in those three books of the Bible, in those three chapters, in fact. Now, if you examine those particular things and then ask yourself, is religion, is the Christian religion faith, who basically is founded on the precepts of this man, does it follow those particular opinions? And the answer is no, it does not. It, it just does not right across the board. Historically, for 2,000 years it has not, and it still does not follow those particular principles. Now, if it did, the whole Christian religion would be much more peaceful and much more loving, and therefore very, very much not be an influence in world affairs when it comes to war or violence. However, because there is this justification of violence by going back to the Old Testament and the way that Jews interacted with the Gentiles and so forth, there is this justification of violence. Once this justification of violence begins, now Christians are willing to justify violence towards people of other religious faiths or, other, or, or, or under certain conditions of being attacked, for example. This is completely out of harmony with love. And this is what I say, if, you, if every single religion on the planet thought about what is harmonious with love and then changed their religious belief systems so that any religious belief system that was out of harmony with love was discarded, then we would be in a much better place on this planet when it comes to religious violence, <laughs> wouldn't we? We would. <laughs> very different place. Yeah. But that, that brings up a very big question. Mm -hmm. and how do we go about this? Uh, what steps do we take? 
Well, you know, if you, if you examine religions on the planet, you've got some pretty major religions on the planet, haven't you? You know, I think, uh, you know, through statistic, I think the Christian religious face, if you added them all together, they would number about a billion and a half, one and a half billion people on the planet who, who regularly practice the Christian faith. Then if you add together the Muslim faith, you know, you've probably got another one to one and a half billion people on the planet who practice that faith. And then if you add some of the other faiths that are, are, are less, uh, less prevalent, you can see that you know, a good half of the world's population probably has some kind of religious belief. Now, uh, and even more, probably. Now, if you examine all of that and go, OK, let's, let's collectively get all of those religious, the leaders of all these religious faiths together and pr present to them the principle that if the principle inside of their faith is loving, then they retain the belief. So if it's just a, an issue with regard to some kind of, uh, you know, what you would call, um, what do you call it, sort of like a, you know, ritual, yeah, some kind of ritual, um, and it's not out of harmony with love, then why not keep it? There's no harm in it, you know, there's no harm in retaining certain rituals if they're uh, completely in harmony with love. But as soon as it's out of harmony with love, we get, get rid of it. We, we say that cannot any longer be a part of our religious faith. Right? Now, if every religion agreed to do that, already you would have the leaders of nearly, you know, half of the world's population coming into more harmony with love. Now, if the people who, who followed them were willing to make the same change, then we could potentially have quite a lot of large change on the planet in a very short period of time. The problem is, though, most religious leaders are not willing to do that. Most religious leaders would like, instead, to, to make every other religion theirs. In other words, to convert the people of other religions to their faith. Because they cannot cope emotionally with having somebody with a different belief. Right? And this is a problem. We need to be able to emotionally cope with different beliefs on the planet, even if they are not what we agree with, as long as those belief systems are completely in harmony with love. If the belief system is in harmony with love, now we have some means of un a uniting force and even though we may disagree with the underlying uh, terminology or disagree with some underlying principles that we're still in discovery of, at least if we all agreed that we were all going to act lovingly and we were all going to be non-violent and we were all going to be pacifist in our nature when it comes to violence, then all of a sudden all religious sectarian violence would cease. Now, I feel today a lot of people use something like that, like some kind of religious change, as a means to attack and be violent. So they use it as a justification. So for example, if a person in a fundamental Christian faith this had to throw away belief systems that are unloving in their nature, then he would have to throw away quite a lot of belief systems actually, mm. if he thinks about it. For, for example, is it loving for one person to pay a sacrifice for billions of people? Probably not, right? No. So there goes the belief that Jesus died for my sins. Out the window. Right? Now, most Christians would have a huge problem with that belief going out the window. They would. Right? <laughs> because they believe that is the fundamental principle of their own faith. But that belief in itself is unloving. Because, because it's not... Like if I made you pay for something that I did, would you feel that was unfair? Of course. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't feel it was very loving. So what do you think Jesus feels about the idea? Not very good. <laughs> Surely he would feel it was very loving too. Mm -hmm. Now, and perhaps God has other laws. God has other principles that every single person is responsible for their own actions. Is that a loving law? That every single person is responsible for their own actions? Now surely that is a loving law in comparison to Jesus is responsible for all of my unloving actions. <laughs> you know, that's not a very loving law. So, so if we examine, examine the principles in the religious space, we would see that if we were truly honest about, this, about the 
goals of love, which Jesus was, by the way, and I'm referring to Jesus now as if not myself, just so that most of your audience can cope with that. When, when I was on earth, though, you know, I never portrayed any religious faith as being better than another. I always talked about the principles of love. It's the principles of love that should guide any religious faith. And if every religious faith absorbed the principles of love, they could retain anything else they wished to retain. But if they absorbed the principles of love, then they would rapidly change and also possibly cause rapid change on the planet uh, in terms of what, how much violence was happening on the planet in particular. Now, of course, there will be fundamentalists who disagree with those particular actions. But, but surely they would not be the, uh, you know, hope, you would hope they would not be the, the mainstay of the whole movement. The reason why is because the majority of people on the planet do want peace. They do want there to be a loving environment for them to grow up in. They do want their children to survive. They do want things to, to be prosperous on the planet. War does not cause prosperity, except for the nations who go to war. You know, it, for the nations who are involved in the war, it causes terrible, terrible degradation to those nations. And you know, if you look at, for example, with the United States, you know, one third of its entire economy is based around war, or the production of arms. And if, if, we, if we asked ourselves as a society, is that a loving place? That's quite obvious the answer. Of course it's not loving to produce arms that then get distributed all over the world and, and they're all killing people. That's what they're made for. Now, that's not a loving environment. That's not a loving place. So, so let's stop those industries and turn them into something that does good for mankind. That's, that's one third of the United States economy, though. Is everyone in the United States willing to do that? Lose one third of their economy for the sake of peace? You know, probably not. Possibly not. But maybe yes. You know, maybe they are sick and tired of this whole cycle of violence. You know, it's been going on now for millennia, and maybe the majority of people on the planet are starting to get sick and tired of having violent act after violent act perpetrated one towards the other, and then the other towards back towards the ori origin. And and surely all of us are starting to see the underlying pointlessness of it all. And and I feel, you know, once people are presented with those particular underlying facts then things can change. Things can change on the planet. So it requires, though, the hearts of individuals change. And for the hearts of individuals to change, they're going to have to change away from a selfish attitude into a more peaceful attitude. They're going to have to change from a desire towards violence to a desire towards peace. And what I mean by that is, it, when most people on Earth are wronged, you know, they're hurt in some way, even if it's only emotionally, most people become angry and violent. That has to change. We have to allow ourselves to feel our hurt, but we have to change in the way that we react to our hurt. We have to forgive. We have to learn what forgiveness is all about. You know, we need to learn how to forgive people who have acted harmfully towards us. It doesn't mean that we continue to put up with their behaviour all the time. And collectively as a society, we don't have to if we all have the same law governing us. Of course. Now you mentioned that to bring a collective of all the religious leaders and to base every religion on love. Does that mean that the Christian God, the Islamic God, they're all the same God and it's a God that just wants love and that the, the principles are just sort of muddled through different, different people? Yeah, what I'm basically saying is that the Christian God doesn't exist mm -hmm. as he is currently conceived. And I'm also saying the Muslim God doesn't exist as he's currently conceived. What I'm saying is there is a God, but the God exists as a in a different conception. And this conception of the real God is based around love, not based around these violent punishing acts. Remember, remember back at the beginning of our conversation, I was saying that, that the main problem that we have in religious faith is that we all believe in a violent punishing God. And if we all stop believing in a violent punishing God, we will stop justifying our own violent acts as well. We will start seeing that God actually doesn't agree with any violence, that actually God doesn't perpetrate any violence nor agree with it. And once we saw that, 
now we could at least introduce that God to every religious form. Like, the Muslim can still worship God, but instead of worshipping the violent punishing God that is, that is outlined in the Quran, he can worship the beautiful, loving, kind, compassionate God who actually exists. And the Christian is the same. Instead of him worshipping this violent, punishing, angry, abusive God who's willing to destroy millions of people at a whim, and he now also discards that belief in that particular God and starts to accept the belief in a God who is beautiful, loving, kind, compassionate, understanding and honest in dealing with all of, all of the people that he's ever created. Now, if both the Christian and the Muslim agreed that that was the God, then you could see they'd end up both worshipping the same God. But if both of them can't agree that that is the real God, that God is actually does have punish under certain circumstances, that God is wrathful under certain circumstances, this is the beliefs they wish to retain, that God is wrathful, punishing, angry under certain circumstances, once they want that, then now it's up to them to define the circumstances. I see. And that's the trouble. So I'll define a different set of circumstances than you'll define. So I will say, as long as you're a Christian, then God's a loving God. But if you're not a Christian, then God's going to destroy you. Right? And you say, as long as you're a Muslim, God's a loving God. But if you're a Christian, then you're an infidel. Right? And what have we done? We've now put our own definition upon what God will do. If we both agree that God was a loving God who would never conceive a violent act, what would we do? We would never say, you would ever be destroyed for being a Christian, and I would never be destroyed for being a Muslim. And therefore we would have peace. I see. There would be no religious violence. Mm -hmm. We could still have our different religions if we wished to retain them. But just that one thing, belief in a loving God, would change so much. I could retain all of the other beliefs I wanted, even if they're false, I can still retain them. Even if they're not scientifically true, I can still retain them if I wish, that one belief that God is a loving God would change our interaction with each other. So when you tell me that you, you, know, you believe in the blood of Jesus, and I tell you I, don't believe, I just believe Jesus was a prophet, right? we wouldn't feel like fighting each other. <laughs> we wouldn't feel like hurting each other because we both believe that God is a loving God and that God would not agree with such a thing from either of us. You see, just that one belief system that has to change, just that one, changing in all religions would actually cause a lot of peace on the planet instead of a lot of harm. And, and I, I'm surprised at this point in time that nobody's thought of it. <laughs> that, that, that it's their concept of God that's causing a lot of trouble. trouble. And that, that then causes them to define when God will get angry. And the definitions of when God gets angry is completely dependent, I find, on the individual thoughts of when God will get angry. Because the individual wants God to be angry under certain circumstances. So, so if I'm a Christian, I want God to be angry towards a Muslim under certain circumstances. Right? And if I'm a Muslim, I want God to be angry towards the infidel under certain circumstances. What? And I've got to ask myself, why do I want that? Because God's not angry. God's not angry, God gave us all free will. Why would he give us free will and then get angry about it? So, God's not angry. So, so if, I, if I'm angry, I need to look at that. Because God's not. Now, if I believed in a loving God who does not get angry, then, then I would start looking at, okay, every time I get angry, I've got something going on. I've got something that's out of harmony with God. And even if I'm not perfect, I should look at that. I don't have to be perfect with it. I need to look at it. I need to examine that. My underlying motive of why I want God to be angry. As soon as I believe that God is an angry God, I am now going to define when God gets angry. And then, the next step after that is to define when I should get angry too. And then, I am now defining violence. I am now defining when violence is justified. And the reality is, violence is never justified. The reality is God does never justify violence. And the reality is God wants us to come to the realisation as, as a planet that there is no reason for us to ever justify violence. Now most of us justify violence because we're afraid of death. 
or we're afraid of physical harm being brought upon ourselves. But, but God, and also Jesus in the first century, told us that there is an afterlife. So there is no death. There is no reason to justify violence, even if somebody's life is threatened. And, uh, and you know, God obviously can correct anything that happens to us physically. So there's no re reason to justify violence under any physical threat. And yet we do. And really they are our definitions of when we should get violent, not God's. And they are because we don't have enough faith in the truth that there is an afterlife. And if you look at that, you can see that the majority of religions do not have a very firm idea of what happens after you die. And because they don't have a firm idea of what happens after you die, they don't necessarily believe that anything good happens after you die, <laughs> even though they say that it does. Of course. And, uh, and so, so if they believe that, then they would not be afraid of dying. And dying and death would not be such a bad, you know, such a terrible event as they currently are for most people on the planet. But that's our fear that causes us to justify violence and therefore to justify a belief in a God who justifies violence. Mm. So, um, of course, you discuss violence. But the big question that, of course, a lot of people want to know, where did violence come from? If God is a loving God, then where did God come from? If the Bible is not literally true, so if it wasn't to be taken from eating the apple, yeah. you know, where is it from? Well, violence comes from our desire to walk away from love and our desire to live in fear rather than live in love. That's where it comes from. So we need to, as mankind needs to start, all of humankind needs to start seeing that violence is caused by fear and fear is caused by not knowing the truth. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So when I don't know the truth about something, I become afraid. So, for example, if I don't know the truth about death, I'll become afraid of death. Once I become afraid, now there are certain circumstances when I will resort to violence. But if I had love as my ideal, I would not resort to violence under any circumstance. And I feel this is the underlying thing that we need to com continually come back to. That unless, unless we all start seeing that violence is not loving, unless we see that, and unless we act, start acting upon that as humanity, as a whole, then we will continue to see violent, unloving acts on the earth. And and of course much damage as a result. So so I feel I feel we need to focus more on this on this idea of learning what love is and then never justifying violence under any circumstance. More than anything else. And if we can do that, then we can change. Yeah. Have I answered your question now? I, I believe so. I believe yeah. so. Um, yeah. Just, just forgot what I was about to say. That's okay, that's okay. Um, oh yes. So, this is going to, for some of my audience, this is going to go into an area they might be uncomfortable with, but I'm going to ask you, since you claim to be Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, therefore you would know something, you know, most people wouldn't, mm -hmm. about this subject, mm -hmm. then tell me, what is the afterlife? Um, what, what most people don't realise is that the afterlife is actually just an extension of this life. We, we are created as a soul that is connected to two bodies, a physical body and a spirit body. These bodies interface with the different worlds in which, we, which we've been created to live in. Now, when we're in the physical world, we're like learners, we're like babies, learning new things. And and one of the things God's trying to teach us here on this earth is, is how to engage our will in harmony with love and what the results will be if we do that. I think we've learnt very well if we engage our will out of harmony with love and with fear what the results are because we've seen the results for the last you know, many thousands of years. We, many of us have engaged our will 
negatively. We then have a tendency towards violence. The violence then causes us to go into, into very damaging acts towards other people. And, and that has been the, uh, the exercise of our will in an unloving direction. So, so we've already experimented with that. We don't, I don't feel anybody on earth needs to experiment with that anymore. <laughs> right? What we need to do instead is experiment with the other direction, engaging our will in harmony with love. Now, now what God's trying to do is that God has created this nursery, the earth, which, which, which helps us to see the effects of our choice that's out of harmony with love and in harmony with love. Now, once we pass, we pass as the same person. We are exactly the same person, but we just have a spirit body. To us, that body then becomes material. It's sort of, it's like the same kind of body that we currently have. We're now existing just in a different dimensional space. Now, mathematics has proven, I think at this point, that there are nine or 13, I can't remember exactly how many dimensions they've actually proven at this point through well, supercomputing. supercomputing. That, that depends on which theory you believe. Yeah, of I course, guess. yeah. So, so they have, they've proven that there are other dimensions, shall we say, mm -hmm. at least more than one. Of course. Now, it would make sense, of course, that we can live in them, mm -hmm. certainly. Now, now, what I'm suggesting is that actually God created a body for you to live in that particular dimension as well. And in fact, in the higher dimensions, God's created a soul for you to live in those dimensions as well. And, and I'm not suggesting that everyone has to believe it. I'm suggesting that we all need to experiment with that. Right? And there, are, there is a lot of evidence supporting the fact that there are spirits. And all I'm suggesting is that spirits are just people who lived on earth, who have now died and passed over. And these people, who are much the same as they were when they were on earth, are able to do different things because they're now in a different body. But it was a body that was created when their parents had sex in the first place. Right? So it's a body that's been with them all of their life. And that person has now the ability to grow in love still, just as they had the ability on earth to grow in love. Or they have the ability to act in a very, in a way that's disharmonious with love. They have that ability too. They can do both things in the spirit world just like they could do both things when they were here. The difference though is that you cannot get to the further dimensions in the spirit world without growing in love. So if you decide to remain as you are here on earth in terms of the definitions of love, then you will remain in the first dimension of the spirit world for as long as you decide to not grow in love. When you decide to grow in love, then you will move to the other dimensions. And I believe it's also possible that we can see a, a world that is similar to those higher dimensions if we all decided to grow in love while we were here on earth. But of course, uh, that hasn't been the outcome at this point in time. But I do believe that is possible in the future. But when I've gone through the spirit world, I have seen the very big difference between what I would classify as the hells of the first dimension in other words, the first dimensional space and how dark people can be in terms of in rage and in violence, right the way through to the heavens, if you want to call them that, of the higher dimensions where only love reigns. I have seen all of those dimensions. And, and if anybody could see those higher dimensions, they would certainly wish to be there. And if anyone could see the lower dimensions, they would certainly want to know how they can avoid being there. And, and what I'm saying to people is that how they can avoid being there is by being in harmony with love. That has always been the case. Do you remember in the Bible, you're a religious person, so in the Bible you remember there's, uh, uh, when I was meant to have spoken, or Jesus if you want to say <laughs> Jesus instead of me, uh, was meant to have spoken about the rich man and Lazarus. Remember mm -hmm. there was a man who was Lazarus, he, he was on earth, he was being fed like, the, like a dog from the rich man's table and uh, they both passed under, in this parable, they both passed into the spirit world, they both died. The rich man was in the hells of the spirit world because of his actions. His actions were unloving, that's why he was in those. The poor man, the Lazarus, was more loving and so he passed into a higher condition. He could see the lower condition 
and interact with the lower condition, but the man in the lower condition could not get to the higher condition. The only way that he could get to the higher condition is by growing in love. That's the only way. The only way we're going to see an improvement on the planet is by all of us choosing to grow in love. It's the only way. And that doesn't mean we'll all accept the same belief systems. But there is a few belief systems we're going to have to all accept. One of them is what love is. We're going to have to all accept that love is not violent. We're going to have to all accept that love isn't punishing. We're going to have to all accept that love is not wrathful or angry. That love, love doesn't resort to those things. That's what we're going to have to all accept at some point. No matter what religious faith or non-religious faith we are of, we can be an atheist and accept these particular positions. In fact, I know many atheists who are far more loving than many people of many religions because they actually do have a pacifist nature, many of them. And for that reason, they will pass into the higher areas of the spirit world because of their, their loving perspective, even though they don't believe in God. So the spirit world is uh, it's just it's similar in some in some places the spirit world is very similar to Earth. In some places it's much worse than Earth as an environment, and in other places it's much 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 better than Earth. It depends where we will be personally will depend totally upon what our soul our soul's condition of love. You know what what kind of life have we lived here on Earth in harmony with love? is going to be the question, that we, the only question, in fact, that we'll finish up asking ourselves. Yeah. Um, Alright, so we see that, that love is the key mm -hmm. to solving, to solving the, the problems of, of violence. Uh, and we've identified that the mechanism of violence uh, in general is due to the, the view of the parents. Correct. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that and to go into, into how this mechanism uh, arises and then contributes to it? So, as soon as we are conceived, we begin absorbing the in condition of the environment. Mm -hmm. And if the condition of the environment is that it justifies violence, then we will begin absorbing that condition ourselves. We'll begin to absorb the emotion of the justification of violence. If the condition is one of fear in our environment, then we will begin internally to absorb the fear itself. If the condition is a, is a condition of love, we will also absorb that. It depends on what, you know, what the condition is as to what we will absorb. We are very much defined by two things. One is our personality, our nature, and the other one is what happens to us. Uh, you know, our environment is a, is a great part of what happens to us. And eventually, as we grow, though, eventually what we decide to do is a great part of what happens to us. So, but before the age of seven, before the age that the intellect is actually fully developed and the brain is fully developed and the physical body has now developed into some semblance of order, before that age, we are very much under the control and influence of our environment. And from the majority of us, we live with two people primarily, our mother and our father, so we are very much under the influence of their particular perceptions. If their perception of God is that God is a wrathful, unjust, loving, unloving God who is willing to punish and destroy the wicked, then I will have probably absorb that perception. Now, if our parents' perception of God is that, then they will also accept that punishing us violently as a child is also acceptable. So under certain circumstances, our parents will justify violence towards us by saying that God justifies violence towards his children. Now in that perception, what the parent finishes up doing is teaching the child this very big distortion. And the distortion is this, that love involves violence. And they'll often say, even to their child while they're punishing them, I am doing this because I love you. I've actually had that said to me while I'm being punished. And I've seen many parents do the same with their children. So while they're actually being physically, like have physical violence perpetrated towards the child, remember this child cannot avoid it because it doesn't have the power to avoid it. This child is being taught two basic unloving principles. Firstly, that God is an unloving, violent God. And secondly, that the parents, who, are, who seem to the child to be completely unloving in that violent act, are telling them that that violence is love. They're telling them that 
you can sometimes love somebody by being violent towards them. Now, once you accept this as a child, there are so many things that you will begin to accept. You will begin to accept violence in your environment. And you'll accept, under certain circumstances, that violence is an act of love. You will also begin to accept violence towards yourself. So you'll, you'll obviously not have a good sense of your own worth. You, when somebody treats you badly, you say, oh, you know, but they love me still. When it's obvious if somebody treats you badly, they're not loving towards you. And you will also have a tendency then to justify your own behaviour towards others. So you might cheat on somebody in a relationship, for example, but say, oh, but I love you still, even though the person was very hurt by your actions and you were dishonest by your actions. And this is because we have all of these justifications that have now built into us through this environment from our childhood. Our childhood has defined to us what we believe love to be, but it's a gross distortion of what love really is, unfortunately. Instead of love being something that is pristine and pure and without violence and without a tendency towards it, trying to harm or hurt another person, now love has become, under some definitions, I can hurt you and I'm loving you. Under some conditions, I can punish you and I'm loving you. And I am willing to accept that God does the same because these are the things that I've been taught from my childhood. Now, if we were brought up in a totally different environment, the and where our parents did not resort to violence as an act of correction, and I'm suggesting that parents can correct children without resorting to violence and without resorting to emotional manipulation. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other ways to correct a child. In fact, the way God does it is through restriction. So, so, you know, we can correct our children through restriction, whether that's physical restriction or other forms of restriction. But that, that is not violent because it's done out of love and it's not physically harmful to the individual. Now, if we grew up in that environment, we would never accept that God is a wrathful God. We wouldn't even conceive a God who is angry. We wouldn't even conceive a, a person who is willing to destroy the wicked if we grew up in that environment. In addition, we would never conceive that parents who are hitting their children are actually being loving to their own children. We would never believe that. And we would never justify ourselves hurting another under the, in the same way, either. So, so you can see that a lot of these belief systems come from this cycle of violence perpetrated towards the child, that the child then absorbs into its nature and then, because it's absorbed it, it's willing to absorb belief system that justify it to itself. To, so, most children, and by the time they become adults, don't want to admit to themselves that their parents were violent towards them. I find it interesting that we live in a society, you in the US and us here in Australia, and most Western societies live in this society, where we see an act of an adult physically harming an adult as assault. Now, in Australia, it can also have a prison term associated with assault. That's how we see adult-to-adult -adult violence. But how do we see adult-to-child violence if the adult is the parent of the child? We don't see it as assault. We see it as correction. We see it as an act of love. How distorted is that? As an adult, we can fight back. As a child, the child can't fight back. But instead of the child being receiving more of our protection, what does it receive? Less of our protection. And this is a very this is a gross distortion of love. You see, because we we believe these things, children are growing up in in, in, in violent, abusive manners. Even the average Christian who smacks their child, you know, whenever the child is dis, dis, disobedient. Under the definition of the law, they are assaulting their child. But of course we don't call it that. We call it discipline. We give it another name because we're unwilling to face the truth about the actual action, that it is violent and therefore unloving. Now if the parent is willing to justify violence towards its own child, 
it's definitely going to be able to justify violence towards a person it doesn't know. And it's definitely going to justify violence in a case of war. If it can justify violence towards its own child, it can justify violence under any circumstance. That's the trouble. So I feel this relationship between the child and what happened to the child in its, in its, in its youth has a huge bearing on what religious faith we will accept. It, it has a huge bearing on what kind of God we accept. And it also has a huge bearing on what kind of treatment we accept, both from ourselves towards others and also from others towards ourselves. And unless we correct this as a society, it's highly unlikely that violence of all, all types won't, will, will remain in our society. Yeah. Do you speak, you just give an example that you yourself were, uh, were told that uh, while being hit there was for your own love. Mm -hmm. Can you provide some background into, into your own experiences with this? Well, if you look at all Christian religious faiths, they all have a tendency to focus on the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes in terms of the justification of violence towards children. So, you know, they say that God says, spare the rod and spoil the child. In other words, that a child needs a rod in order to be corrected. That's really what they're saying. They're really saying that a child needs to be strapped or whipped in order to be corrected. So, in other, in other words, that a child needs to experience violence in order to have correction. Now, I can't agree with that, but that's the, that's the life I was brought up with in this life. And it was also the environment I was brought up with in the first century. You know, there were quite frequent times when my father hit me as a result of the same belief. And, and the reality is that it is just an act of violence. But no parent wants to accept that for some reason. I find it ironic that no parent wants to accept that, because if I went up and punched them in the nose, they would accept that as an act of violence. And they'd probably want me to go to jail for it. Yes. But, but when they perpetrate a similar act towards their own child, they do not want to accept that as an act of violence. And they call that discipline. They give it another name. And then they also say that God justifies such an act. And they read out a Bible verse that justifies the act. And this is all out of harmony with love. It's just a justification of their own violence towards another. And in particular towards a person, a child, who is unable to protect itself. Now, what is the worst kind of violence? The worst kind of violence is towards a person who cannot protect themselves. So they are actually perpetrating the worst kind of violence when they do this. Now, when you are brought up with this, you think this is normal. This is the problem. What we believe to be normal, we then, in, we then impose upon society. So if I grow up believing that violence towards children is normal, then surely I would also believe or accept inside of myself that violence towards a person who can protect themselves is also normal under certain circumstances. And this is the problem. But all of the Christians and most of the Muslims and many other religious faiths are taught this, of course. So they're taught that, that this kind of violence is acceptable. So if I'm going to be taught that it's acceptable from a very, very young age, then I'm going to grow up believing it's acceptable and I will probably perpetrate it towards my own children because I believe that that's what God wants me to do. So even while I am doing it, I'm feeling bad about it. Now, I've had this situation where I've smacked my own children. I've got two sons, 28 and 26, and, and, and both of them I smacked. Believing that I was doing the right thing, even though it felt wrong at the time. Now, if I listened to my feelings rather than the Bible, I would have been in much higher condition of love. If I listened to my feelings and I went, wow, this does not feel good. There must be some alternative to me spanking my children to correcting them. There's got to be some alternative. Now, if I had done that, I would have been in more condi a higher condition of love. I didn't do that because I had been taught to believe that that's what God wanted me to do. And, and this is where I've got to give up this belief about God. You see, I used the belief about God as a reason why I had to even take an action that I personally did not want to take. 
So this is the problem with such books that are based on, on things that are out of harmony with love, is they cause us, because of our belief, to take actions that we can feel, even inside of ourselves, at the time, are actually wrong, that are actually out of harmony with love. And we feel it, but we still go ahead and do the opposite, because we've been taught differently. That's how strong this childhood belief is that gets pushed upon the child. We grow, when we grow to an adult, we believe we must do the same thing without questioning whether God is a God of love or not and without questioning whether the act is violent or not. Now, when I look at that now, I am horrified that I could have even considered that. I am horrified that anybody on the planet can consider violence towards a child not as assault but as correction. When, when, when we consider violence towards an adult as assault, this does not make any sense to me now, now that I've had some growth in love. Right? But before it made sense to me because I accepted that the Bible was God's Word. And I, since I accepted the Bible was God's Word, I believed that I must do this if I wanted to be in harmony with God. And I never considered whether God was such a person. I never considered that because I was taught that the Bible is God's word, right down to the last letter. I was, you know, over and over, all scripture is inspired of God and beneficial for all things. <laughs> for correcting, for reproving, for setting things straight. You know? I've heard that one a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what I believed. And since I believed that, I then took an action that was blatantly unloving in the belief that I had to do it to get God's approval. Not considering whether God himself would actually ever consider such an act. Now that I've grown up to, you know, I've, I've become a bit more grown up in my interaction with um, God and also my interaction with love, I can see very clearly that such justifications are not warranted and nor are they valid, nor are they, logi nor are they logical. But when we're taught to believe something that, that uh, is blatantly false and blatantly unloving, unfortunately it can be, it takes a lot of self-reflection before we can get to the point where we see that it was actually false. And that's the trouble we face here on the planet. The trouble with the re religious indoctrination is that it causes the next generation to believe things that are, that are about love that are false. And that's the main cause, I believe, of religious violence of all kinds. Interesting. Mm. So, what steps are you taking to promote peace building? Well, basically, what I've been talking with people about is obviously you can't force change upon people for a start. All you can do is encourage them with some logical thinking. So in this discussion you can see that my logic is fairly flawless when it comes to the examination of things like our belief in a wrathful God and what that justifies, our belief in a, you know, our, what happened in our ch ch childhood and our acceptance of a wrathful God. We can see the interrelationships of all these things. Now, all these things need to be said, and said more, by more than one person. <laughs> Now, of course, not many people on the planet are willing to say these things because it confronts the whole concept of family, parenting. It confronts religions of all kinds, not just the Christian faith or the Muslim faith, but all forms of religion on the planet are going to be confronted by the different statements. And so very few people are willing to stick their neck on the line and say, look, these are, all of these things are out of harmony with love and this is the reason why. So the first thing that we're willing to do with our personal life is to stick our neck out on the line and go, no, all these things are out of harmony and love and this is the reason why. Secondly, we want to address this underlying reason why we accept things out of harmony with love, which has to do with this relationship between parental training of acceptance of violence in the child. And we want to talk about that and work our way through that emotionally. We've got to get to the point where we forgive the parent, which means going through a whole series of feelings about what the parent's done towards us, to get to the point of forgiveness. 
we need to get to the point of forgiving the parent for what they've done and therefore we'll be able to forgive society for what it does to us that's out of harmony with love as well. So in other words, we'll be able to act in harmony with love with everyone around us without when it's immaterial what they do to us. So they still might attack us but we'll act in harmony with love every time because we've forgiven, because we've automatically gone through this process where we've developed our love enough where we've exceeded the, the, the basic principle of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, which, as Gandhi said, makes all of us blind, right? And, and we've exceeded that definition of love to the point where we go, no, I am going to forgive any unloving act towards myself. So what Mary and myself do is we personally practice that, but also we, we, we teach that for free to anybody who will listen. And we do interviews like the one you're doing now to anybody who listen who, who listen who wants to talk about it. We 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 do presentations for free with anybody who listen. Now the way we live is that people donate to us because they appreciate the material that they've heard. But we only have a little box up the back that they can donate to. That's how we live. We actually believe in what we preach, and we actually practice what we preach as well. So. So I feel what it needs initially is firstly one person to believe this, this underlying, uh, underlying principles about what is true with regard to God and with regard to love. And then eventually they will infect through a process of discussion other people and inspire other people to do exactly the same thing. And eventually more and more people will inspire other people and eventually it will become some kind of movement. Now, I wouldn't call it a religious movement because it's not about religion. It's about love. It's sort of like a... It's better... It, 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 to me, is more of a societal movement that needs to occur where we all eventually get to the point where we decide, yes, this way of living, this loving way of living, this non-violent way of living, uh, even in the family, because this we're where the, not, the violence starts, a non-violent way of living is the best way of living. And we've got to give up all of these belief systems that we have that cause us to believe that violence is something to resort to under certain circumstances. Now, now I believe once enough people logically understand that, and they can be atheists or religions of any kind, we can all understand that, and once enough people understand that, then, then it'll, be like a, it, it'll just be a movement that just catches a light on the planet and moves the planet into a new place of peace. And so I believe very strongly that we are capable of having peace on earth and goodwill towards all men, as <laughs> the Bible actually says. Yes. And I I'm, I'm believe very strongly, though, that it needs to be done in the hearts of men. You know? And quite often I said to people in the first century, look, you listen to me, but your hearts are unresponsive. And, and really, for us to all change in love, the heart has to become responsive. The heart has to go, oh yeah, hang on a sec, I do not want to be this unloving person anymore that I've become. I can see why I've become it, and that's all to do with the past, and it's all to do with how my parents treated me, and how the environment treated me, and what that caused me to justify. It all has to do with my belief systems about God, and my belief systems about what's the right religion, and all these things. Once I give up all of that, and I'm not saying you have to give up all the religion, or, but you need to give up the unloving belief systems. And that's going to be emotional. It's going to take some emotional work. You know, you can't just do it in your head. You're going to have to change it in your heart somehow. And that's going to be releasing the beliefs that you have that are out of harmony with love, so that you can accept the beliefs that are in harmony with love. Once a lot of people decide to do that on the planet and then a movement slowly grows where that occurs, then you'll see huge changes on the planet, I believe. And I believe huge changes are possible on the planet. And the reason why myself and Mary are here again is because we believe the planet's ripe for that kind of uh, change. But, but, but it can't be forced upon people. It has to come from within them. Yeah. Now you mentioned a movement of love, so a love movement kind of reminds me of like the 60s, I'd say. <laughs> so would you equate this new movement sort of to the, the hippies and... No, the, the hippie movement was very unloving. It firstly had a lot of sexual unloving things occurring, 
It was, it was often addicted to drugs, which was also quite unloving to the individual. And in addition, it was a more of a rebellion against authority. And rebellion against authority is not a love towards authority. So, so you know, I cannot define the 60s as a, as a loving uh, movement that occurred. Now, sure, certain things changed in the 60s that were more loving. You know, there were, there were more countries that accepted women as equals to men, although you'd have to ask how well that's really taken on, considering even in the most, of, most developed of Western countries, for most of them, women are still paid less than men. So, you know, you'd have to consider or, uh, whether some of these movements have had a really long-lasting effect yet on the planet. But there certainly were changes that were positive in that regard. You know, there was far, there were far, a good change was that there's far less sexual control over women. So that, that is a good change. A negative change is that the less sexual control resulted in a bit of a backlash where women became more promiscuous, and I don't think that was a very good change. So I feel there were positive changes and, and negative changes, as there are in almost every generation. But if we asked ourselves, this generation, if this generation asked itself, how are we going to become more loving, then I'm sure we can see that there'd be a much more positive change uh, and particularly if we were willing to address within our hearts the reason why we're unloving. You see, many people in the 60s, for example, thought the war in Vietnam was in error. But they were willing to be violent in their protest towards the war in Vietnam. So the war in Vietnam was violent, and they resorted to violence to stop the violence. And that's not a loving act. You can't resort to violence and, and hope that violence stops because it, it, violence perpetrates violence. We, like historically, we know this now for generations that violence perpetrates more violence. So we can't expect to stop violence by rebelling against a violent act by becoming violent ourselves. So these were mistakes that were made in the 60s, I believe. But, um, but there were also some good changes that occurred in the same era um, because people started to see inequality and, and inequality is never a positive thing for the earth or for any person on it. Even the people who have an excess, it's not good for them to have inequality because they then develop arrogance and they develop this idea that they are superior to others and that causes them to act then in violent ways towards others because they believe themselves to be better. So having too much or too little is also a problem in either, either direction. We are able to generate societies and politics that, that are not communistic in their nature, but actually do support the free will of the individual, but also include love in, in the entire politics. And at the moment, that's not seen on the planet either, but uh, that is also possible. There is enough intelligent people on the planet. You know, you're going to university, you know, the room is probably full of intelligent people. Yes. There's enough intelligent people on the planet for us to change. The key is whether we badly want to or not. Really, that, So it gets down to our underlying personal motivations. Are, are we willing to actually change our personal life in the direction that we feel the world should change? And that's the thing that myself and Mary are attempting to do, to change our personal life in the same direction that we would set, like to see the world to change. And we feel that if, if we do these things strongly enough, and with, enough, and with enough motivation, and our motivation has to be based upon love, then, then sooner or later people will listen rather than just attack. You know, so we've been accused many times of being like leaders of a cult or some kind of religion or whatever, none of which is true. You know, as you can see in our house here, we've got no fences or gates or whatever else, and you walked in the front uh, and there was no fences in the front. We've got a little two-bedroom house of our own. Uh, we're not into having huge amounts of money. If I did have huge amounts of money, I'd know where I'd kind of spend it. <laughs> and, you know, and it would be to help a lot of these problems on the planet. But the reality is, you can see from the way, that even just by visiting us once, by the way we live our life, we're not bossing people around, telling them what to do. We're just suggesting that if, you, if we want this world to become more loving, We've got to give up the belief systems about God that are unloving. We've got to give up our personal belief systems, whether they're religious or family-based or not, doesn't really matter. 
that are unloving and we've got to start to accept more loving belief systems as an emotion, as an emotional process. Once we do that, these emotions of love will drive our nature. And once they drive our nature, we will be loving to other people around us. They will feel our love and then feel like they would like to do the same thing to others. And eventually you have this growing, and I, I, for the sake of a term, I can't call it anything other than just a movement, if you call, call it that, a, um, a groundswell of people who have decided to love rather than to live in violence and rather to live in fear. And so rather than doing that, they want to love. And, and I feel once we do that, and I'm not talking here about free sexual love, I'm talking about the real love that comes when I treat you as I would like to be treated. That kind of love. And once we all decide to act in harmony with that principle, this world will be a much better place to live in. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned the, the sexual prom uh, promiscuity, the 60s, the drugs, mm -hmm. rebellion. So that brings me to, what about the, the morality that religion gives? Each religion gives their own version. Is there a certain set that is correct? And, and what religion did that come from? Well, I believe that once we all begin to accept that there is a God of love, mm -hmm. and we accept that we are able to communicate with this God of love through a process, then we will be able to listen to God about what is moral and what is not. And instead of taking our own uh, ideas about what is moral, that we will start to accept God's ideas about what is moral. But as an underlying principle, whenever somebody is hurt by an action that we take, we must consider whether we have taken a moral action or not. Now, I'm not talking about someone being hurt about being told the truth, because to me the truth is always going to be beneficial to the individual. In fact, I believe the truth will set me free. That's why I said it. But, but we, need to take an, we need to take a look at ourselves by going, OK, what actions have I taken that have harmed another, that they have expressed their harm, the harm about, you know, that they've felt hurt about, that are truly loving or truly unloving? I need to ask myself the question. So what I'm suggesting is that if we... Oh, there's a bit of a breeze coming out. It might mean a bit of rain. You know, but what I'm suggesting is that if we ask ourselves what is loving in every place, then we'll be able to determine what is moral. So, for example, if I am in a partnership, a sexual relationship with another person, let's say I'm in a relationship with Mary, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I'm in a sexual relationship with Mary, is it loving for me to have a sexual relationship with somebody else if she is going to feel hurt about it or if I feel I have to cover it up? Then obviously not. Then I can, e I can even determine, would I like her to do that? Would I would mind if she uh, had a sexual relationship with somebody else? How would I feel if she did that without telling me and, uh, and covering it up? How would I feel? Now, if I would feel hurt, then I shouldn't do it to her. It's quite simple. Now, that issue is an issue of what I would call ethics, not morality. There's a big difference between these two things. Recently, I think it was in Melbourne in June or May or something like that, I think it was in June, I gave a talk to a group of people in Melbourne about ethics and morality. And I defined ethics as this, doing to you what I would like you to do to me. That is ethics. So in other words, if I have ethics, I will never do something to you that I would not like you to do to me, that if I had ethics. Mm -hmm. Now I believe that is different to morality. Morality, I do not believe it is my right to decide. Rather, I believe it is God's right to decide what is moral. Now, how do I determine what God has decided? It's not going to be through a book, because as I've already stated in this discussion, the book is flawed. It's flawed because it believes in an unloving God, and that is the big basis of its major flaw. 
right? If I believe in a loving God, and I have a way to connect to that loving God, now I am able to receive from God that information about morality. And I wouldn't impose it upon anyone else. I would only impose it upon myself. Right? I would only impose what I've learned upon myself and not upon anybody else. So, let's say, in this relationship with God, as I've explained in the first century and now, the relationship with God is all about, firstly, being humble to your own emotions and feelings. Secondly, being open to truth. The way we become open to the truth is by being humble. We can't learn more truth if we're arrogant. We already believe we know it. Then as we are getting the harmony with truth, if we have a longing for God's love, we will actually start to feel it. You, you will feel love enter you from the being, which I call God, enter, enter, enter you. Now, in this relationship that gets established, I can then begin to ask questions of God. And when I am out of harmony with love, that love will not flow. And this will tell me what is true and what is not. In that process, I can ask God about moral questions. You know, is it right to be gay? Now, I know it's right to be gay because I know friends who are gay who still receive this love from God even though they are gay. And this proves to me that it's okay to be gay from God's perspective. But when they are immoral, in other words, when they have many partners, they do not receive this same love from God. And that tells me that from God's perspective, it's not being gay that is the problem, and it's not being heterosexual that's the problem, it's being promiscuous that's the problem. See. Right? And a person who is promiscuous will not be able to receive this love from God. And in this process, this is the process I went through in the first century and I'm going through now, you learn directly from God what is morality. And that's different to ethics. Ethics are learnt differently. Ethics is just that simple question of what, do I, what would I like you to do to me? Because that's what I should do to you. That's ethics. Morality is what can I learn from God about the best way I can live? And that's not the best way you can live, by the way. That's the best way I can live. So when I enter this communication with God, I will absorb the best way I can live. Now, eventually, if we're talking to the same God, eventually you will come to the same conclusions. But you might not come to the same conclusions at the same time. And I will not force this conclusion upon you. So, for example, if you believe that, that lying is okay under certain circumstances, what I would say to you is that, look, rather than accept my opinion that it isn't, why don't you try to have a relationship with God and receive love from God while you're lying and see how that goes? And I can guarantee to you, you will not receive it. But try it and see. Experiment. So what we would do is we would begin to experiment with this relationship with God. And through the experimentation with the relationship with God, we will learn morals that we will impose upon ourselves only. The reason why we'll never impose it upon another is because we do not have the right to impose it upon another. Because the reality is, love does not give us rights. Love is a gift. And when we give the gift of our love to another, it's a gift we're giving to them. We're not giving them rights, we're giving them a gift of love. Love does not take rights, love gives gifts. And once I learn this underlying principle that love gives gifts and love does not take rights, I will see that I do not have the right to impose my moral stance upon you as an individual. All I can do is suggest to you that you try to have a relationship with God while you have that moral stance and see how it goes. And if it doesn't go well, then I would suggest to you that perhaps that means that God doesn't agree with your moral stance. However, if we can all agree with one moral stance, and this is this, that love is not violent. That is a moral stance. And if we could all agree with that underlying moral stance, because it, because it has ethical proof. If I am violent to you, I certainly wouldn't probably like you being violent to me. So that tells me that love is not violent. That tells me, it gives me an indication of what the moral stance should be. Does that make sense? So, so if we choose as a basis for living ethics first, it will lead us to what is the correct moral stance, eventually. And if we develop this relationship with God, as what I'm suggesting that people do, and I've been suggesting it for 2,000 years, 
if we develop this relationship with God, eventually we will receive morality, we will receive what the definition of God's definition of morality is towards ourselves, but we would certainly not impose it upon another because to do so would be out of harmony with ethics. So that's how I see the difference between ethics and morality. Sure. Sure. So, your entire philosophy comes down to the one principle of love mm -hmm. and the incorporation of love into every a aspect of, of life. life. Yeah, aspect of every life. aspect of life. Politics, religion, medical profession, every single thing that you can think of in life. How you look at the environment, how you look at people, how you interact with your children, how you interact with your family, how you interact with, you know, insects and animals and birds and all creatures of God's created. It does pose the question of if you were to treat an insect with love, uh, an animal with love, plants with love, mm -hmm. how are we supposed to survive if we do have to consume something else? Well, let's look at uh, the issues of love there, because there are many issues of love involved in the consumption, in consumption. Firstly, if we look at the issues of love, we can see that there are certain things that God has provided for us that regenerate as we eat them. So, for example, if we look at fruit, for example, we can see we, we can eat a whole fruit tree of fruit. If we save the seeds and plant those seeds, there'll be literally thousands of fruit trees growing from those seeds. So we're not actually destroying the process by eating the fruit. We're actually creating a process that can grow. So, so we're actually, you know, we're, we're consuming the fruit, but actually enabling a complete process that will involve, will involve creation to a larger extent than was possible before. If we examine almost every uh, veg vegetable thing, we can see that there are literally thousands of seeds produced by every vegetable thing, generally. And, and this is an indication of plentiful, there's plenty, you know, there's, uh, there's abundance. And to me, anything that's abundant is where we should go. Now, if we look at what happens with regard to meat production, and we look at uh, consuming meat, we can see a very different course of action. If we, if we look at what happens generally with the consumption of meat, we, we inseminate cattle, generally, we allow the cattle to procreate, they destroy the environment to a large degree, they take ten times the amount of energy that it takes, in it, and it's known for, as a fact that it's ten times the amount of energy that it takes to produce the same amount of food, vegetable, that, uh, um, sorry, ten times for the animal than it does for the vegetable. This is a great indication that we should all be at least vegetarians right, on the planet. Now, you, you will hear many millions and billions of people go into protest about that. However, if every single person on this planet ate meat to the same amount that people in the Western world do, we will not even have a planet left to live on if we continue it just with that endeavour. So this tells me that it, it is not economical. It tells me that it's not uh, feasible for long-term sustainability. So therefore it tells me that it can't be loving. In addition, if I look at the pain the animals go through, there's a very good movie that I suggest every single person watch called Earthlings. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Um, we've got a copy of it here, but uh, it's, just a, it's just an awesome movie explaining what what mankind does to animals in the in meat production. If any person, my, like my own son who ate meat four times a day, three times a day, watched that movie and he became a vegetarian overnight, right? Because it, it is so blatantly obvious that it's unloving what is happening to these animals, right? And if you watch a movie like that, and that movie was put together by a very clever group of people showing exactly what is happening to animals on the planet. If every person on the planet knew what was happening to animals, their own hearts would be so, so affected by it that they wouldn't be able to eat meat anymore. And the reality is that eating meat is very, very damaging, not only for the environment, it's damaging to human health, it's damaging to the animals themselves. They go through huge amounts of pain, many of them 
go through huge amounts of torture in order for us to survive. These are all things that are not loving. It's quite obvious. And once we embrace that, and once we see that, and once we're willing to be educated about that, it's highly unlikely that we'll choose to eat meat after we've embraced that. Now, again, let's look at the religion of it. The Bible says that God gave Noah eat meat to eat. Right? And many Christian faiths use that as a justification to eat meat. And yet, how many people on this planet would be willing to kill the meat themselves and eat it? How many people in the Western world would be willing to slit the animal's throat, gut it, skin it, and then cut it up and then eat it? Very few, in fact. That's why we have butchers doing that for us, because we want to get away from these dirty processes that we often feel are quite bad, and we give them to somebody who's willing to do it, right? for the sake of some kind of financial reward. And, and the reason why we do that is because we don't want to be personally associated with an act that is obviously violent and yet we let somebody else do it for us. And so I feel again if we took that underlying thing that love is not violent. If we look at the average uh, lettuce when it gets picked there are no obvious feelings of violence that we can detect. So therefore let's trust that for the moment and unless in some point in the future we can detect that a lettuce feels violently treated amongst its people, then let's eat a lettuce instead. <laughs> Though, than eating a, a, a lamb, you know, or eating a young calf for veal. Um, because, because if you look at the, the act towards the calf, it is obviously violent. And to me, again, it's a simple decision. Do I want to perpetrate a violent act towards my environment, or do I not? If I love, I won't. If I don't love or I don't care, then I may. The reason, one of the large reasons for your stance, correct me if I'm wrong, against eating meat is, is that the production of the animals, cattle, chickens, mm -hmm. etc., mm -hmm. uh, is damaging to the environment and thus is unloving. And is also no, the, the, my, biggest, my biggest complaint against it, and again, this is just a comment, it's not a judgment, but, but my biggest complaint against it is because is I have personally killed an animal. I know what it feels like to kill one. Right? I've done it a number of times with my father when I was young, and I know what it feels like to kill one, and it feels like a violent act. Right? And I cannot perpetrate violence towards something that feels so strongly, as, as a other living creature like, a, like an animal has. And, and that is my primary feeling about it. The, the issue of economy is secondary, but it is an issue. It does take ten times the amount of energy to produce that amount of meat as it does to produce the amount of vegetables. And third reason why is that I've been living this way for a long time now. The third reason why is I understand how the body works. And I know that the body needs amino acids, not proteins, in order to grow protein. And I know that. And I've seen that happen in my own body and in the bodies of others. And I also can see that the main reason why some people who go vegetarian have a degradation in their body is because of their belief systems that they have absorbed from their parents. The belief that the parent has that it's unhealthy to not eat meat is absorbed by the child and that causes them to become unhealthy as a result. So, so I see all of these things and that's why I'm healthy, but I'm, I'm vegan and, but, but healthy. And I feel that uh, this is something that each person again can experiment with and try. But it is a moral choice. So I cannot force it upon people. I cannot, all I can do is make the suggestion. Try to stay at one with God and have a relationship with God and eat meat. And I can guarantee to you, you will not be able to feel God's love while you're eating meat. Uh, actually, I went to a, a youth conference um, about renewable energy sources. Yeah. And uh, I ended up driving and I drove a group of girls. They were all vegan, yeah. so I ended up being vegan for a weekend. Yeah. I can honestly say it wasn't bad. That was going to be terrible. Yeah. 
food was fantastic. Yeah. You couldn't tell the difference. So. Yeah. Yeah. No and, al and also, you know, most people on the planet have no idea how to use spices. And, mm -hmm. and a person who's vegan generally learns after a while how to use spices. <laughs> and uh, after that, everything tastes fantastic. <laughs> this is true. The only thing I see is that just as the cattle takes energy to, to, to live, mm -hmm. and it takes 10 times the vegetables, humans take by far more than cattle to, to survive. And yet we reproduce at such a high rate and populate the world. Is it unloving to have such a high population to where people are forced into situations that are less than less than in the Western we'd call you know um, livable? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, um, it's not well known, but there's been studies made on the planet already, uh, scientific studies that have been made that feel that that have resulted in in concepts that, that the planet can actually support 10 times the amount of people that it currently supports and still every and still have enough uh, vegetation on the planet to support other functions such you know such as our breathing and other, other things like so like that so the reality is the planet can actually support 60 billion people now I'm not suggesting that we do that but I'm saying the reality is that we can support that but we can't support that amount of people eating meat at all. And in fact, if we, if we chose to have everyone on the planet currently eating meat as much as the average person in the Western world eats meat, we would find that uh, our planet can't support as many people as we currently have. So if we examine that p particular position, we've got to start asking ourselves, what are we doing that, that is saving or sustainable for the earth? And so while it is possible that we can eat meat, and when we can, because we, we can physically do it if we wish to, the question then becomes, is it advisable? It's like, it's possible for you to smoke a cigarette, but is it advisable? It's possible for you to have sex with hundreds of women if you want, but is it advisable? These are the questions we've got to start asking ourselves. And this is where it gets down to the morality of it. And morality is always going to be based around love. So we need to start asking ourselves, even though it's possible that we can eat meat, and many people are doing it, is it the best thing that we can do? Is it, is it the thing that we can do for our own health? Is it the best thing for our own health? Now it's starting to be, you know, different studies have come up recently that, you know, people starting to see that more red meat in your diet is linked to specific diseases, for example. And we're starting to see the link between diet and disease in Western culture. Now, these studies, of course, have been done with lots of resistance because most of us want to, most of us in the Western world want to eat meat, so we don't like to pay taxpayer fund towards a study that proves that we shouldn't. <laughs> And, uh, and what we need to do with all matters, I believe, and this applies to all matters scientific of any nature, we need to be willing to see a new truth. The only way we can be willing to see a new truth is to be willing to let go of the old one. In other words, we're going to have to be humble. And, and humility requires... Uh, new truth will never come to us unless we are in a state of humility. But humility requires that we are self-analytical that we're honest with the way that we see ourselves. The problem I feel that we have here on the planet is most of us have been taught to be dishonest about how we see ourselves. And in fact, many Western cultures are based around a facade completely. You know, it's all about the car and the house and the, and the, the pretty girl on your arm rather than, rather than what's actually happening inside of yourself, inside of your feelings and emotions. And in fact, we often, often there's very few people around us who actually know us as a result. Many people do not know us because we've, pre we've presented the facade for such a long time that we've come to believe it ourselves, but there are private times by ourselves that we feel differently. I feel what we all need to do is be willing to be humble, see ourselves as we accurately are, see, see also that unless we're humble, we will not accept new scientific truth. We will not except things like, you know, the fact is it takes 10 times the amount of energy to produce the same amount of food if we eat meat compared to eating vegetables. So surely this would tell us 
that if we want to love the rest of mankind and have enough food on the planet, then surely the best course of action is to eat vegetables rather than to try to say, give them all contraceptive. <laughs> Because giving them all contraceptive doesn't actually solve the problem in a lot of ways, but also giving them all contraceptive doesn't look at this problem that we have, and that is this problem that we're willing to use ten times of the resources for the same effect. Now, why are we willing to do such a silly thing? Right? When you think about it, it is a silly thing to use ten times of the resource for the same effect. You might as well use ten times less and you have the same effect. So, you know, it doesn't make any sense from an environmental perspective, from a love perspective, from a, from a love of other people perspective, to continue doing that. And what we need to do is be open to that concept. And if we're not open to the concept, we, and we, 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 we want to eat meat, we're just going to say, no, 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 I'm not going to look at that concept for the rest of our lives. But the problem is there's all this violence being perpetrated towards animals. There's all these violent, uh, there's all these violent things happening to the environment as a result of our choice. But we're all blaming it on somebody else because they're the ones who did, you know, they're the ones who knocked down the football field. It wasn't me eating the meat that did it. But, you know, myself and Mary had just been to Brazil. A lot of that country, the Amazon rainforest being destroyed, like acre after acre after acre being destroyed systematically just for the production of beef. And that's why it's being destroyed. And when you look at the difference between the Amazon forest and the actual parts that have been destroyed, you wouldn't recognise them. There's no, there's no, that they are so far apart from each other that most people would be absolutely shocked if they actually saw it. Now, this is an indication that it's that, that our choice and decision is out of harmony with love. It's quite obvious, but most of us don't want to accept it. And this is, this is where I say, you know, getting back to our original discussion, what, when we start confronting the issues of love, then people complain. Interesting, you know. Then people's pet desires are all challenged, you know. But if we are going to truly be a loving society, we are going to have to challenge all of our pet personal desires if we're truly going to change as a society. And this applies to religion, politics, environment, every aspect, as I've said. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Getting back to the original topic mm -hmm. about like. What I'm, what I'm getting at with the population is, of course, your first time here, the population was significantly less yes. than it is now. Yep. And it is growing exponentially. Um, it is growing, yes, I agree. And so if in our current direction is towards 60 billion, although far from it... We're at 7 billion now, 7.2, around about billion people. But the, the, the slope is, is in an upward direction. Sure. And people are becoming more centralized in cities and becoming closer and closer together. Yep. Does that play a role in the promotion of violence? Well, let's look at. Uh, there is an emotion, certainly, that plays a role in violence, and it's the emotion of not having enough. Uh, many people, even who have enough, believe they don't have enough and they want more. So it's an emotion of lack. So we're afraid of not having enough. And this fear of not having enough causes us to act violently towards others who have more than us. Now, um, I feel, firstly, that it needs to be corrected from two ends. It needs to, the people who have too much, who have far more than what they could ever use, need to consider giving some away. Um, because obviously they have far more than they could ever use. And it makes no logical sense for them to retain it. The people who do not have enough need to be given something so they do have enough. We need to also change the economy to a large degree. We need to change the economy from an economy that is based around paying for food and paying for water and paying for, for a cover over your head and paying for cover over your body. These particular essential items should not have to be paid for. They need to be given away. And whoever produces these particular things, we need to support them as a society so that they can produce these things, so that they can give them away. It makes no sense for a society to charge for things that are essential. It only makes sense for a society to charge for things that are non-essential. 
If the thing is essential, such as food, water, shelter, clothes, then surely it makes sense that, that we should be helping whoever produces these things to produce them free of charge so that society can live in a more beneficial way. Now, if we did that, there would be a much more peaceful result on the planet in terms of you know, production of food. But getting back to the population issue, if we did that, there'd be a sense of peace and prosperity on the planet. In addition, if we corrected these unloving viewpoints about God that, that many people on the planet have, including this idea that God wants you to have hundreds of children, right? because the, many families are still having children that they cannot love, because they don't even have enough time in their day to even see them, let alone love them. And if we corrected that, if we corrected how many children people are having through love, not by making some rules, but rather by say, saying to people that, look, we, we, we need to consider the concept of only having the number of children that you can love, rather than considering the concept that you have as many children as you, as you want or desire. Now, many nations are having a lot of children because of fear of lack. They fear what will happen in their old age. It's only their children who will look after them. If they only have one child and that child, something happens to that child, then there's no one to look after them in their old age. And that's because we, they live in a society where they don't care about looking after people in their old age as a society. So it all gets back down to love. Many times people choose to have children not because they enjoy sex and they enjoy having children, but rather because they're afraid of what will happen in their old age. They're afraid of the aspects such as longevity. They're afraid of who will care for them in their old age. They're afraid of what will happen when they get older and in terms of their environment and, and how they will live. And so many of the countries in the, in the so-called third world are not, concern, are not concerned about um, contraception. Because, because they believe having as many children as possible is the only solution to their own care. In other words, they are afraid. Now, if there was no fear, and there was abundance on the planet, and there was nobody who was old who was afraid of dying because they had no one to care for them, then surely when they were young, they wouldn't start having so many children if there was contraception available. So again, it gets back down to education about the principles of truth and of love. I feel like, you know, you can throw, you can throw any situation at me <laughs> and ask me about it and if I think about, okay, how does love impact this situation? I will always come up with an answer that is going to have, be the most loving answer and also the best beneficial outcome for every single person on the planet. That's the reality. But if you throw a question at me um, and ask the question in terms of justifying violence or justifying a lack of abundance or lack or whatever, then of course, you know, that's what we're going to get. We're going to get today's environment, which, which is some countries have abundance, some countries have lack. A lot of countries have lack, actually. Some countries have prosperity. A lot of countries uh, live, in, uh, people in a lot of countries live in a terrible subsistence, really. Many people in the world, in the Western world, have a roof over their head. Very few people have any substantial roof over their head in other countries. Yeah. Many people in the Western world have their meat to eat. There are many people on this planet who have nothing to eat in the course of the day. And, and for, their, for these imbalances to be corrected, the people who have abundance need to learn how to love, not learn how to demand more. And they need to not focus so much on their, you know, on their feelings of lack. They need to just learn how to love more. I just need to have a break for a that, bit. That's fantastic. Yeah. So. Getting back, once again, to the basic topic where we started off with. Mm -hmm. Where do you see interfaith peace building beginning in the world? Where, where currently do you see it springing up? Besides here, of course. Um, well, I suppose there's a difference between where I'd like to see it spring up and where I do believe it will spring up. Um, 
where I'd like to see it spring up is amongst the leaders of the world's religions. Um, and this is a lot about, there's going to be a lot about accepting a change in their belief about God in the sense that uh, God is a loving God only, not a God of wrath, not a God of punishment, not a God of destruction. These kind of basic principles need to change at, at the leadership perspective. If it changed at the leader perspective, then what would happen is that uh, this perspective would be taught to the majority of people or adherents of those particular religions. If it was taught, then over a period of time, and I, I believe it would be over quite a rapid time, because, it, because the reality is a lot of people in grassroots religion do not necessarily believe everything they're currently taught. And, and the, the proof of that is that you ask the average Catholic whether he or she believes that Jesus is God, and the answer is actually no. But the very religious Catholic will say yes. Um, if you ask the average Catholic whether they believe hellfire exists, you know, many of them don't know. But the religious viewpoint is yes. You know, if you ask you know, the average Muslim whether they believe that uh, attacking another person in, in a different country because they have a different faith is the right thing to do, he would say no. Right? But the underlying belief system by, by right-wing uh, Muslims is possibly yes. So, so can you see that really um, at the grassroots level often the opinion is very, very different to the religious leaders. Now, if the leadership changed in the sense of if they change their feelings about matters and they change their desire to control the people, then, then of course the people would change quite rapidly, I believe. However, the likelihood of that happening is fairly low, probably. Yes. The problem, the reason why, is because people who are in leadership generally have power over others. And uh, it, I find it quite amusing, actually, that I'm often accused of having a cold when the reality is I have t and take no power over any other individual, when those same people who are accusing me of having a cult have a huge amount of power over the individuals they lead. And to me, that, that is a cult. The, the many of the religions on this planet are cults. They, they have a huge amount of control and manipulation and control uh, and power over people who are their adherents who are all who believe the same things. And in fact, whenever you attempt to believe something different and remain in the religion, the amount of uh, violent opposition you receive is, is so high that most people can't endure it. And this is an indication that actually many of these religions are cults in themselves. But if we examine the uh, actual underlying principles, we can see that if the leadership changed and became more loving and also incorporated more loving beliefs into the, the particular religious practice, you can see that people who are listening to those particular religious faiths would probably be very impressed and probably change quite rapidly as a result of the leaders making personal changes and also showing to people the reasons for those particular changes and explaining to them in a logical way why these particular changes are necessary. However, because of the leaders generally, most people in leadership positions have an addiction to power and have an addiction to control and manipulation and glory, the chances of the people who are leading changing are a lot lower than the change chances of the average person changing. So the way I believe change will probably occur, unfortunately, <laughs> is that the average person becomes tired of religious beliefs that are false, that are perpetrating violence. They become tired of uh, religious beliefs that attack other people and condemn other people. And as a result of their becoming tired of such a thing, they begin to change themselves. And as they change, they finish up leaving the religious faith that uh, taught them those particular untruths. And, trying, and they try to absorb a religious faith or find a religious faith perhaps that actually accepts these new found belief systems that they have. I believe that that is the slowest form of change though, because the most rapid form of change, which is the leadership changing, would have the greatest lasting and, and rapid benefit on the planet. Um, whereas individuals changing, it takes a groundswell of individuals to reach, to reach a critical mass before actual change occurs. 
It's very similar to politics in a way. If you look at what's happening in the Middle East at the moment, you can see that many people, the groundswell of people, are tired of many of their politicians or their leaders. And, and it's taken, uh, like the, the leaders aren't changing. They know that the people are not happy with them and they hear about it often enough, but the leaders themselves refuse to change because they like the power, they like the prestige and power that they have, and also the amount of financial control and other aspects that they have. Because of their unwillingness to change, change becomes forced upon them by the groundswell. Now, I'm not suggesting that it should be violent, as it currently is in the Middle East, but, but it's an illustration of what actually occurs. Unfortunately, because the person who is in power is unwilling to embrace principles of love themselves, as a result, the people become so disenfranchised with the leader that they eventually leave the leader anyway, and then eventually force change upon the leader that the leader did not want to accept. It would be far better if the leader observed the disenfranchisement of the individual within the country or within the religion, and then ask themselves the question, what, this can only be occurring because something is out of harmony with love. What is it that is out of harmony with love in my own personal attitude to life and what I am trying to enforce people to do? And, and if the leaders then made that change, there would be a great change of, and a rapid change of people on earth because the people would readily accept the change. That's the irony. So, unfortunately though, I feel that probably what will happen is the opposite. Uh, until the leaders see a pattern and they begin to see, well, actually, if I change, then things, you know, then change can be more easily managed and it not be violent. Um, and, and the average person will resort to violent on the planet, violence on the planet, unfortunately. But I do believe that uh, sooner or later the average person will get to this point where they no longer want to resort to violence. They'll no longer agree to going to war. They'll no longer agree to picking up any arms. They'll no longer agree to do any of those things. And once there is a groundswell of those particular people who have enough faith to do that, then change will occur anyway, either way. Either way, change is going to happen. If we are truly going to survive on this planet, and, and not only just survive, but also thrive and prosper, change has to happen. And, and it can't remain the same as it currently is. We're, we're in the process of destroying the Earth so rapidly and, and harming individuals and people on the Earth so, so much that, that there's so much rage and hatred that if something doesn't change, then we, we, we leave ourselves in a very, very precarious state. So you, you would like to see the leaders to trickle down, you know, mm -hmm. start with the leaders. How are you influencing the, the religious leaders of the world? Well, at the moment I aren't. Uh, that's the reality. The reason why is because they can just call me uh, a leader of a cult. Um, and in calling me that, many people go into their fear. The leaders of the earth are very adept at using people's fear against them. And as a result, that causes many people on earth to not listen to the voice of reason, which I believe I am. And any person who speaks with me generally can see the reason in what I'm saying. So, so I believe that people will listen to reason once they are open to listening to reason and not focusing on their fears so much. So, so these leaders are adept at manipulating individuals through their fear. That's, that's how many times they got into a position of power. You know, religious power usually comes from the fear of God. You know, political power comes from the fear of the state. And, and you know, fear is something that is manipulated greatly on the planet. Now, if the average person on the planet was less manipulated by fear, then they'd be more open to truth. And if they're more open to truth, then they'd probably be able to listen to people like myself saying what, you know, because there's many people on the planet who even might not be talking about God, but at least talking about needing to have a non-violent loving stance. There's literally thousands or probably millions of those people on the planet. None of them are being listened to because many people are afraid. Um, but we, so we need to overcome our fears. That's one thing that all of us on the planet are going to need to do. 
But I feel the only other way is to confront the religious leaders or the leaders of any system, religious, political or otherwise, with their unloving stance. The only way we can do that is with logic. We can, you know, we can logically present why the stance that they take is unloving and hope that eventually the reason, the, the intellectual capacity every person on this planet has to reason, will actually step up and go, wow, that is a logical perspective. And, and therefore, why aren't I you know, doing something about that perspective personally? I feel once uh, people do that, then, then the, really, the leaders will take some notice. Up until the time that the see the, the leaders believe they can manipulate fear and therefore gain the acceptance of their behaviour. If leaders weren't able to do that anymore, then of course they would probably be more inclined to change. Um, but uh, you know that that is only going to happen when people generally, the masses generally, are no longer manipulated by their own fear. And, and to do that, they're going to have to release some of their fear. They need, they're going to have to face some of their fears and work their way through them and release them in a psychological sense. Um, the, the other thing, though, is that sooner or later, um, many religious leaders and other people will hear and already have heard of what we've been doing. Where I am this one voice in the wilderness <laughs> <laughs> crying out, um, but but many people have been um, have heard it even through attack. Like so, so there's been many uh, false media reports, of course, and and that is all about control and manipulation as well. The, the media is all about sensation. The only way they're going to get lots and lots of viewers or lots and lots of readers is to create a sensation. And if there's this guy up in the middle of nowhere in Queensland claiming that he's Jesus. That's a sensation. And if we can create a sensation around him where everybody disbelieves him, then, then he, nobody's ever going to listen to what he says. And so they believe that they can create a heap of lies and, and misrepresent the truth about, about us and our life and get away with that. In the long term, they won't. And the reality is there are many people here in Australia who have even have heard about us who know that what the media is saying is just lies because they've seen the media do the same thing with other people and they know what the media is like. Sooner or later though it'd be lovely if somebody in the media had a positive presentation of the truth about even this movement or any other movement on the planet that talks about love. You know, Imagine for example if the movie Earthlings which is a documentary was actually shown on mainstream television like a documentary about eating meat you know, uh, that would be fantastic too. I just believe there is so much truth available on this planet, but the mainstream is not picking up because everyone's afraid. And it requires a few courageous people with integrity to stop being afraid and to just tell the truth as it is. Sooner or later, everyone will hear it. And with the mechanisms that are available now, you know, of, of, the, of the internet and so forth, it's easy for everybody to hear it if they desire to. Yeah. And I believe that's how, prob how probably how change is actually going to happen on the planet. I believe most of the leaders will probably resist change. And the reality is uh, that many of these leaders are led by people in the spirit world in, in, who are unseen to them. And unless those particular people change, the leaders probably won't change. And unless the leaders change, then, then change will happen at the grassroots, as, as it historically has done for many millennia. But it doesn't have to be that way. No. <laughs> it would be nice if it was a different way. <laughs> Just to, to ask one thing about uh, something we previously, or you previously mentioned, you said that it is unloving for the, for the government to, to place rules such as you can only have so many children, etc. Mm -hmm. Aren't rules just a, a, a constraint? So wouldn't that be loving instead of uh, giving like a, you know, a, a violent order of if you have more than one child, you will have this punishment. Oh, of course, there are levels of. Of course, of course, of course. Of course. <laughs> so, so you know, if if you have more than one child, we're going to punish you. Mm -hmm. 
is a very, very unloving act. If you have more, if you if you have a law where you have one, ch if you have more than one child, we were going to give you less funds, then that's a less loving act than the pri pri sorry, a more loving act than the prior one. You know, it's, it's less unloving, more it's more loving than than the, the violent constraint. However, we do have to get to the point eventually on the planet where where we start seeing love as what is the most loving course of action. The most loving course of action when it comes to, to procreation, for example, is really all about helping people understand um, how procreation occurs, when, it's a, when is it good to have a child, and, and what are your alternatives um, before that point. In other words, education is the underlying uh, and what does education do? Education removes fear. That's what education does. But it has to be education in harmony with love. So in other words, if I have an education, say I'm the Catholic Church, and I have an education, to have contraception is unloving, which is their statement basically, now the education towards all of the parents who are having, engaging in sexual activity is basically if you have any form of contraception at all, you're being unloving. And God's going to condemn you. Now that kind of education is archaic and destructive. There's no other word for it. It's archaic, destructive, and it causes many of our problems here on earth. That kind of education. There is, there is ways to prevent procreation and still allow people to have sexual intercourse and desires. Um, but many people in holy churches don't like the concept of people having sex. In fact, the very leadership of the Catholic Church is in direct disharmony with the Bible itself on the, on the matter of whether the priests can be married or not. Like in the book of Timothy, it actually says they can, and yet the Catholic Church says they can't. Right? Now this is an indication of how far a religious order is willing to take their piety to the, to, to the extent that they're even willing to override the thing they think they say they base their entire principles on, the Bible, in order to gain power and control. Now, this is out of harmony with love greatly. So, so if, we, if we looked at what was loving, we'd say, okay, from the Bible's perspective, procreation is, a, is something that can be allowed. From that perspective, when does a child become a child? My belief is that it's at contraception. If I prevent contraception, I'm not being unloving. Conception. Con sorry, conception. Con yeah, if I pre prevent yeah. conception, I'm not being unloving. But it depends how I use my contraception. If I use my contraception to terminate the pregnancy, mm -hmm. now I'm being unloving. If I use contraception, to prevent pregnancy, then I'm being less loving. Oh, sorry, more, less unloving, more loving. So, so it's very important for people to see that there are more unloving behaviours and less unloving behaviours. And an unloving behaviour would be to terminate a child. A loving behaviour would be to prevent a pregnancy. Now, now, if I am a member of a religion that states that contraception is not allowed, or is, is, is damaging to your relationship with God, then I am automatically now promoting having child after child after child after child after child after child, after child. even children that I cannot love. I, I will have so many children in the end that I can't love them all. I, I don't have enough energy to love them all. And that in itself would be an unloving act. And if, if, if the Catholic Church saw that, then it could help one and a half billion people on this planet to 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 be more considerate about what they're doing with their with with their procreation and also with their attitude towards sexual activity. Staying on the topic of sexuality, because sexuality is such a a, a large part of, of humanity, mm -hmm. and also as Sigmund Freud linked it to the, a child's image of, of parents, would you draw the connection between your view of love and how your parents treat you and their understanding of God and sexuality? 
Well, certainly um, my acceptance of beliefs about God are very much dependent upon my parents' uh, belief systems and how my parents have treated me, actually. So, you know, I will greatly accept that God is a punishing God if my parents have been punishing and told that they're, that they're, that they're loving. If my parents have acted in any way sexually that are um, what I would call pious, um, in other words, out of harmony with, with the truth of what God created, but um, where my parents are trying to be holy and they view sex as an unholy act. And this is a common viewpoint in many religions that sex itself is an unholy act. And then, of course, I will have a disposition as their child to also conceive that sex is an unholy act, and I will either rebel against that position or accept it in my adulthood. Now, when, it, when, when we get back to the question of sexuality, we need to get back to the very, very basics of our creation. The fact is, all men have a penis and all women have a vagina. That's a fact. They also bring sexual, both, both uh, apparatus, shall we call them, uh, gen genitalia, bring sexual satisfaction, which is a beautiful uh, feeling of joy. It is obvious that God intended it that way, otherwise God would not have created it that way. So, so the reality is too, if we examine the woman's body, we can see that there is a part of her body, the clitoris, which enables her to orgasm without actually having penetration, which indicates that that part of her body is actually being created just for the enjoyment of sexual pleasure. No other reason. There's no pre procreative reason for having a clitoris. Right? Aside from the fact that it, uh, it, it causes her to desire sex, perhaps. <laughs> but aside from that. And, and if we see these particular things, and we, we can see these are in the human body, then we can see very, very straightforwardly that God created men and women to have sex. The question becomes, rather than whether sex is holy or not, because I believe sex is holy, because God created the apparatus to have sex. So rather than asking the question whether sex is holy or not, and therefore allowed or not, we need to ask the question of what kind of sex is loving? It always gets back to the question of love. Of course. So, so, is the kind of sex that results in me having lots and lots and lots of different partners loving to those partners? That's the question I have to ask myself. Is it loving to my own body? What is the results of me having sex with lots and lots of different partners? What happens to my own body when I have sex with lots and lots of different partners? Well, there we can also see what happens. We can see historically that if we have sex with lots of different partners, we finish up having diseases associated with sex with lots of different partners. This is an indication that something is out of harmony with life. So, so this is a logical way that we can determine what's in harmony with love and what is out of harmony with love. And, and we don't hardly need anything else other than that to determine it in reality. Now, we could, of course, connect to God, as I suggested earlier, in this relationship, and try to receive love from God while we're having sex with different partners and see how it goes. And I can assure you that you won't receive love from God while that's happening. But, but people might need to experiment with that to work that out if that's what they want to do. You will actually get to a point eventually where you, when your relationship with God, where you've grown so much that you will only wish to have sex with one partner. However, you won't wish to have it only once a year or when you want a child. You'll want to have it as often as you can because you'll enjoy it. And, uh, and this is also a state where, where I feel what happens a lot of the times is we do not look at the underlying emotional reasons why we are so resistive to basic human functions like sex. Uh, and again, it all gets back down to love, I feel, like in terms of, a bit of exercising a bit of logic and, uh, and a bit of love in the analysis. We'll always gain a conclusion that, that will, in the end, almost, I feel, almost everyone around us will be able to accept. 
However, of course, the religious pi 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 what was the name for that? The person who have religious piety and believe that sex is not holy, they of course may not believe that. Of course. And that's up to them. As long as they do not force that upon me, <laughs> I am okay with that. If they attempt to force that upon me, now they are being unloving. And therefore, out of harmony with love, they are not pious religiously either. <laughs> yeah. So, sexuality can be loving. Yes. And with Sigmund, with Sigmund Freud, of course, seeing that the relationship between child and, and parents is based a lot on sexuality and competition of the child desiring the mother and um, wishing to, to, I guess, kill off the father as a competitor. Does that tie into to your view that the child's relationship with the parents can either determine how, if, if they view God as loving or, or violent because of this competition? I see what you're asking. Firstly, I'd like to say that Sigmund Freud has since changed his perspective as he's arrived in the spirit world. But secondly, um, you know, he can see that his own perspective was very much flawed by his own sexual relationships and his own childhood. And his own analysis psychologically was very much determined by his own childhood and his own relationships. So, so firstly, someone who's famous, like, like Sigmund Freud, is often affected in their line of choice of discovery by their own childhood. And he now sees that. And, however, if we're looking at the question of uh, violence towards uh, the opposite, the same gender parent, uh, or towards the competition, then I do believe these emotions do exist in people. They exist for a lot of different reasons. Often mothers set up competitive relationships with their daughters, for example, uh, competing for their husband's attention. And this causes sexual damage to their daughters. Uh, often the father has a high sexual investment in their daughter. In other words, the father doesn't want the daughter to engage sexually in another man. And this sets up an investment that is very damaging to the daughter sexually. I believe if, if the parents had healed their sexual emotions and worked their way through their sexual issues, those particular things would not have occurred. For example, if the parents were in a loving sexual environment with each other, and reveled in that relationship, then it would be impossible for the, each of the parents to invest in either one or the other gender child. They would not wish to invest in the child because they are, are sexually and emotionally invested in each other. What you actually see happening in many relationships on the planet though, and in particular with many you know, adult relationships, is that that the father or mother or both have issues with each other sexually towards the opposite gender. This causes a huge amounts of investments in their children instead of in each other. And it's the investment in the child, particularly the investment in the child to become asexual or to become sexual with the parent, that causes a lot of the child's sexual damage. And that certainly does need to be repaired. if if the family environment is going to become more loving. Right. So, to summarize our whole discussion, mm -hmm. first off, the biblical, the biblical view of God, and in most other large religion, or any religion, mm -hmm. should be based on love. Yes. And that any, any aspect of it that is violent is not in accordance with God. Yes, and not in harmony with love. Not in harmony with love at all. Yep. And that love is the base, it should be the base for everything in the world and our basic world view. And every law that we make and every decision we take. So love should be the basis of our ethics. Yes. And from our ethics, we can derive our morality through God and our application of our ethics into life. Yes, well, even, even just the application of our ethics will help us with morality. But if we decide to involve God in the process, which is a personal choice and decision that any person can either choose to make or not, then they will find that more rapidly, that's all. Far more rapidly, because God's able to communicate with us directly. But if they don't wish to do that, if they applied these underlying principles of ethics, they would still discover a large degree of morality that needs to be applied to the planet.
And then within morality, uh, one of the largest issues uh, of Christianity, and that, that branches off into many other subtopics, sexuality. We've discussed that sexuality is a natural function, mm -hmm. a function that God intended humanity to enjoy. Yeah. Yes, God would not create a penis or a vagina and then ask us not to use them. <laughs> <laughs> God would have instead have not created them. <laughs> And from this, from this function that God created, uh, we also we also have the ability to sexually damage someone, mm -hmm. which can be seen as a violent act. Yes. And thus, love must be brought into sexuality. Yes. Just as every other function of life. Yes. And as we probe into it, even down to where we get our food from, love must be included. Yes. Uh, also, we need. The world to change the world, we need a, a movement of love mm -hmm. to spread these ideas. Yes. And although we've discussed that a top down from the lead, from the religious leaders would and be and ideal, political leaders, and, and political leaders, leaders, and political leaders, and all the other leaders of the planet, yes. A trickle down would be would be ideal. Yes. However, we we will most likely see a grassroots coming up from the common man, opening up to the to the ideas and realizing. That, that love is the basis, yes. and they will do this by overcoming their fear. Yes. Uh, one of it is fear of death. Well, well, their fear of death, their fear of other people's opinion. <laughs> there, there are many fears, actually, if you list them all. You know, we could go on for ages listing them all. But also uh, their fear of God, that God is this wrathful, punishing God, and if they change their mind that maybe they'll get it wrong and then God will punish them. They need to release that fear. They also need to be humble. Uh, because to be, I feel humility is a big part of this because while you retain an arrogant position you will never accept something that's new you will never accept change it, to, to accept change and accept something that's new you have to really be in a, quite a humble state where you realize that maybe I don't know everything and maybe what I need to do is, be, is realize that I don't know everything and therefore be more open to more truth and, and as we open up like the humility is the opening to truth. As we open up the truth, we'll be able to accept it. If we don't open up to it, we'll never accept it. It's, it's sort of like a person who's a bigoted racist never opening up to the fact that racism is an unloving conception. Like it's, it's an unloving concept to, to, to be racist. Um, and if he never opens up to that idea that he maybe is being unloving, and he's not humble enough to see that, then he'll never accept the truth that racism is an unloving concept. Yeah. So that brings up your two points mm -hmm. of humility and truth. Yeah. And from truth, we, we do see the, the need to love or develop. Love and develop, mm -hmm. uh, realize our fears, yeah. overcome them. Yeah. And from there, we can move on into understanding love, applying love to our life, yeah. and then others will see that and replicate that yes. in their life. But it has to be not the definition of what I want love to be, mm -hmm. but rather the definition of I, what I am, what I would like you to do to me is what I am going to do. Mm -hmm. That is the definition of love, that ethical definition of love that we need to have. Rather than going, this is what I think love is. You should love me. <laughs> you know, love is a gift. It's not something that can be demanded. So that's out of harmony with the ethics in itself. Yeah. So, so to summarize your viewpoints of love, uh, as you just said, there's two there's two styles of love, mm -hmm. two forms. Yeah. The individual, which is of course the, the love that comes out, out of the person yes. towards another, and that's the application of the golden rule. That's the application of God, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But but not the application intellectually. It's mm -hmm. an emotional feeling that I want to do that for you, not not a thought that I have to do it for you. There's a very big difference between having to do it and wanting to do it. So in other words, if I apply the golden rule from my soul, from my heart, then what I will do is I'll apply the golden rule of wanting to do for you what, what I would like you to do for me. Whether you do it or not, I would want to do it. Not because I have to, not because God might punish me, you know, not looking around for God's wrath to come down, but because I want to, because I want to love you. Um, so that, that's the application of the golden rule from your heart, not from your head. So, um, and then the second form of love is about God. Mm -hmm. The more I can receive of God's love, if I'm open to receiving it, which is going to involve me being hum humble and truthful with myself, 
if I, the more I receive God's love, the, the greater ability I have to be able to become more loving myself. But of course I don't need to do that. God doesn't expect me to do that. I can still become loving on my own to a degree. Maybe not to the same degree as receiving God's love, but I can still become an ethical, loving individual without God. Perfect. So to bring us back under the umbrella of religion and violence, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, you see religious violence and all violence as wrong. Mm -hmm. You want to promote peace building through love mm -hmm. and you think that or you believe that love if applied to all aspects of life will create a society that, that needs not violence yes and, and we'll be able to all have different opinions we'll be able to all you know, exist with different religions if we wish to we'll be able to all have different scientific viewpoints if we wish to, although I doubt whether we'd wish to when we're loving, but, but you know, in the sense that we, we'd want to accept what the truth is rather than just have our own opinion even if it's not true. But if we, could, we could have all of these different opinions, we could, and still live in a harmonious, peaceful environment. And then lastly, to further go into love, we see that, that love really stems from the child's relationship with the parents and how they their environment growing up. Yes. So our definition of love is greatly coloured by the environment of, of our society and our parents and everything that is part of our society growing up. And unless the society's viewpoint of love changes, it's very difficult for the individual's viewpoint of love to change. Well, thank you so much for the interview. Uh, it's, uh, a pleasure. it's a pleasure uh, to find out your opinions and to understand more about how you see peace coming to the world yeah. and how you understand religious violence. Yes. And it'll be very interesting to see uh, what kind of discussions ensue with your, uh, with your classmates on the subject. Of course. Uh, because I just feel that many times when we analyse these particular things, we're often thinking from different aspects than what the underlying cause is. And it'll be interesting to see whether any of your classmates believe my approach is logical. <laughs> I think they will. I think they will. Yeah. No worries. Thanks for your time, mate. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to, good to meet you. Good to meet you. Yeah.